really, if you think about the heart of the church is, is to glorify God in worship, and it's to go out with the gospel of, of Christ and to share his love with a world that desperately needs to hear that. And right in the middle of that is the third purpose of the church, and that is to grow believers to become more like Jesus Christ. If you look at Jesus' example and his disciples, uh, they had interactions in life uh, that took many forms. And there's nothing in scripture that alludes to a discipleship program. It says, here's what you need to do when you're gonna disciple people. Discipleship happens when we invest in each other. We see discipleship happening on a daily basis in a variety of forms. Uh, I think of something like a group setting where our, our, our women's ministry is a great example of that, where women are discipling one another and they're learning in a group setting. I, I think of maybe in a setting where it's one-on-one, -on -one, walking through the Bible together over a cup of coffee. It could be something even as simple as a, maybe an older believer gathering with a younger believer and, and more of a, a mentoring role in a very uh, fun and vibrant setting. Setting, uh, something like we might experience uh, going out for a bike ride. And so discipleship takes many forms, even when it's a, a husband-wife relationship and you just kind of share what's going on in life, what God's teaching you through his word and, and how can we be praying for one another. So discipleship is all of that and all of those different forms happen here at Shoreline on any given day in many different ways. It's the best way to live. It's rich and it's deep and it's meaningful and it's powerful. So to be part of that at Shoreline is simply to be part of taking what the Lord gives us and then finding ways to invest it in others. I see that as discipleship. So if you've come to the cross accepted the grace of Jesus, confessed your wrongs, and said, Jesus, I need you to be the one who saves me, the one who takes my life and leads me. If you've done that, you are part of God's church. You belong in his church. And that's God's church gathered and God's church scattered. And the church is part of God's plan to bring his love to this world. And the church really exists. And we started talking about this last week, and we'll talk about some more next week. The church really exists for three reasons, to do three things. Number one, we exist as God's people gathered like this, and when we're scattered, to glorify God, to, to lift him up, to praise him, to worship him, to say, God, you are good and glorious and beautiful and powerful. Someone say amen. amen. I mean, we exist to glorify God. That's why we exist. But we also exist not only to go upward, we exist to go inward toward each other in community so that together we can grow to be more like Jesus, to talk like Jesus, think like Jesus, act like Jesus, speak like Jesus, be motivated with the heart of Jesus. That, that, that's called discipleship or community where we come together to grow in faith together. We exist, yes, to go upward to God and worship. We exist to come together in discipleship and community and fellowship to be the body of Christ together. And we also exist to go outward there's a world that needs to know that God loves them too. And his, and his presence is available and his forgiveness is free and beautiful and glorious. So we go share that with the world. The church exists to go upward in worship, inward in discipleship, and outward in organic outreach or evangelism. That's why we exist. Amen. And today we're talking about the second part of why God has put us in this world and what he wants us to do. And that is the idea of discipleship, of spiritual growth. And, and I had an experience this morning that put all these pieces together for me. And it was really kind of funny because um, it goes back to Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, I got a, a nice card for my wife. And I wrote a nice note to her. And I, I let her know that I love her and she's wonderful. And all the things you, you're supposed to say every day of the year. But you especially say on Valentine's Day. And, uh, and then I also said to her, and, and my gift to you. Is I, and, and here's the thing, when I, I learned, when I first got married, I just thought you could just get a gift and give it, and I thought that was good enough. I found out when I was married, that's wrong. Um, it has to be thoughtful. That's why you have to, it has to be a thoughtful gift. And so I've learned that, that like in the weeks and months before a special holiday, when I'm going to get a gift, I've got to be listening and paying attention, and, and I'll hear, oh, that's an idea, you know, and then and I get that thing, it's thoughtful. I, you know, I, I thought, use my brain. And, uh, and so... And so a while back, uh, Sherry has, has this, you know, like this favorite pair of shoes she really loves. And she was like, yeah, she's, these things are kind of falling apart. And she showed me, she said, they're so comfortable. And she really likes them. And she said, I, I think I'm going to you know, get some get new shoes to replace these ones. So I thought, ah, ha, ha, that's something she really, that would, that she's 
matters to her. So on the, on the back of the card, I wrote, and here's what I want to give you for, for Valentine's Day. Your gift is going to be two things. One is I want to just take you out and let you get whatever shoes you want to get to replace those shoes. It'll be kind of a fun little time. So, but the bigger part of the gift is that I'm, I'm going to give you two hours that I'm going to go shopping with you, and, I won't, and I'll be, have a good attitude, you know? Um, <laughs> Because for me, going shopping is like being put in Dante's third ring of hell. I don't know if you know, if you know, you know your college literature, but it's like, I just hate it. And so I said, I'm going to give you two hours with a good attitude, and we get to get some. So I'm thinking, this is a great gift. I'm thinking, I did a, it was thoughtful. It worked. I thought I did a good job. So I took the card, and I put it on her pillow, and, uh, and then um, the next day came, and that night came, and she didn't say anything. So I'm excited. and you know, Nothing. I thought I did pretty good. And so this morning, I said to her, and, oh, and I, had said, uh, I had said, and we can go shopping around here, or in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to Sherry's, uh, to be with Sherry's family, because her dad and mom are having their 60th anniversary, which is an amazing thing. And so we're going to go celebrate. Yeah, that's, yeah. 60th anniversary is a beautiful thing. So we're going to be going, and I said, so maybe, or maybe we'll go shopping in Holland, because she likes, their, that's her hometown where she grew up. And so this morning I said, well, I guess it looks like, because the weekend kind of went by, and she never mentioned shopping or the shoe or any, shoes or anything. So I said, well, I guess we're going to go shopping in Holland. She says, oh, why? I said, you know, for Valentine's Day. And she goes, what? And I'm like, did you read your card that I gave you? And she goes, yeah. I said, well, your gift. She says, what gift? And I realized something had gone wrong. And so what had happened was, uh, this is this morning, what had happened is she'd opened the card, and, and I said all the nice husband stuff on the first page, and she thought that was it. And she never turned the card over. So I said, well, I guess you're not getting shoes. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but but I, I said, I said, uh, I said, honey, did you read the back of the card? She says, oh, is there something on the back? I said, so she went over and got it. And then she, she goes, oh, and she was all excited, right? Um, I think sometimes when it comes to our Christian journey, some people, you see, when you come to the cross and receive Jesus, two epic spiritual things happen. One, Jesus becomes your savior. He saves you from your sins and from hell and from judgment. And he saves you with his love and his grace. And his grace. You're saved. So he is your savior. But also he becomes your Lord, the leader of your life, the one who guides all you do and all you say. The one who, and, and, and so I think sometimes we get the card from Jesus and, and we come to know him and we open it up and we go, okay, Jesus is savior. He washes my sins away. He gives me new life. Heaven's my eternal home. I'm loved beyond description. I have spiritual blessings. I have the joy of salvation. All these things are going to be, yeah, that's great. And here's what we forget to do. Turn the card over where it says, and Jesus is Lord, the leader of your life. And I think that's a gift because every day becomes an adventure of growing to be more like Jesus, of speaking more like Jesus, thinking more like Jesus, loving more like Jesus. Your life gets transformed. That's dynamic. That's exciting. And I think too many Christians have read one side of the card and never turned it over to realize that Jesus is not just my savior. He's also the leader of my life. And when he's the leader of my life, it grows my attitudes to be like Jesus. I grow in God's word and deeper in God's word. I learn to speak to him in prayer. I learn to be generous with all he gives to me. I learn to serve others. I learn to share his love. I mean, all these things that are dynamic and powerful. And we just didn't turn the card over. And so today we're talking about that, that second part of being the church, and that is spiritual growth, discipleship, being God's people as we grow in this journey of transformational power of the Holy Spirit in us. That's exciting. And I hope what happens today is you say, I, I want that. And if, you, if you're walking down that road, I hope you want it more. This sermon is for everyone who has become a follower of Jesus or who might someday. The only people this is not for is if you're absolutely perfect in Christ, and you have no more growth. You are so like Jesus, there's nothing to change. And if you think that's you, talk to your kids, if you're a parent, or your spouse, if you're married, or your friends, and they might give you a new perspective. It's all of us. We have so much growth that needs to happen. And so, so, so the writer of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, this powerful book that's really steeped in the Old Testament and the history of Israel, but then it comes to the New Testament, and the writer of Hebrews is looking at some people and saying, here's the problem. You, you've looked at the first part of the, 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 the card, but you never turned it over. You never grew in spiritual formation, or you can call it spiritual formation, discipleship, spiritual growth. I don't care what you call it. It's becoming more like Jesus. It's growing up in faith. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. He says, in fact, this is to a bunch of Christians, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you should be so mature you're teaching others to grow in faith, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You're not growing. You need milk, not solid food. What's he saying? He's saying you're still spiritual babies. 
And you should be feeding others, but you're still having to be spoon-fed. Anyone who lives on milk still being an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It's about spiritual maturity, following Jesus as the leader of your life and growing up to be more and more like him. That's the transformation he wants to see happen, and that brings us joy. When you walk on that, that journey and you take steps forward in growth, it's amazing. It's exciting. It's dynamic. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the apostle Paul says to these Christians in the city of Colossae, you know, why, you know, why focus inward? Why grow spiritually? Why keep taking this journey of discipleship and spiritual formation? And the apostle Paul says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, he's the leader of your life, so here's what it looks like. You continue to live, in, live your lives in him. This is that inward journey. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith. If you have your own Bible and you were taking notes, highlight or mark, rooted, built up, strengthened. You get the picture? I mean, you're being strengthened. You're being built up. You're being rooted in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. There is something about this journey of spiritual growth, this inward journey of going to be more like Jesus that draws us into community. I've, I've grown a lot. A lot of my attitudes and my, my, the things in me that were wrong and just not honoring to God, are being transformed over time. Sometimes it happens when I'm alone and I open the word every day and I spend time with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. We need to be scattered, growing in disciples, going inward. But so much of it has happened in community. I've learned what spiritual maturity looks like by watching people that are more spiritual mature, spiritually mature than me and learning from them. I learned as a teenager how to care about, uh, how to care about a woman from a young college guy who loved Jesus and was planning to get married to this young woman. And he, and he treated her with such kindness and such grace. And which, with such Christian maturity for a 19-year-old. I learned how to love a woman as a young Christian man by this guy who's a volunteer in the youth group. But being in community grew me. I, I've learned so much through being in small groups and fellowship and classes. God uses all those things to expand our faith. So why focus inward? Why, you know, why say, I don't want to just glorify God and worship. I also want to grow deeper in faith along with God's people. Why focus inward? Because God longs to see us grow and flourish in maturity. God is longing and excited to see us grow more mature. It delights his heart. Like a parent who watch a watches a child who, who <clears throat> refuses to walk, refuses to you know, take the spoon and serve them, just that they, just they won't do anything. It's, it's, come on, honey, you can do this, you can do this. God's saying, come on, here are my kids, you can grow up. And when he sees all the potential in you to grow you and to use you for his glory... And you or I just kind of say, well, I'm happy where I'm at. You know, God says, I long for more for you. Why focus inward? Because there is far more God can do in and through us than we imagine or dream. Amen. God wants to grow your kids and your grandkids, your friends, through your life as you walk on this journey of spiritual growth together. Iron sharpens iron, and we help each other grow spiritually when we're in community. The, the world needs Christians who are serious about their faith, and that happens when we encourage and challenge each other. Why focus inward? Because we grow stronger in community than we do in isolation. And I love, I, I, every morning I'm in the word, I'm praying and God's speaking to me and there's certain things I learn that God teaches me. But when I take those things and talk with another Christian about them, have a conversation and their perspective, what about this or that? It sharpens my thinking. There's something about community. And, and we believe at Shoreline that discipleship doesn't just happen like in one narrow way. Spiritual growth isn't just, okay, on Tuesdays for four hours, we're doing this thing, and now you're going to become a mature Christian. Man, spiritual maturity comes when a dad or mom or a grandpa or a grandma kneels down next to a bed with their little grandchild or their son or daughter and prays to Jesus and teaches them to pray. That's discipleship. It happens when people grow and get together in a small group and learn together. It happens when, when friends over lunch Talk about faith and what they're learning from God. That discipleship happens in a thousand different ways. And Pastor Dennis, I'm going to invite Pastor Dennis to come and join me. Pastor Dennis is one of our executive leaders in our whole discipleship area. And he's going to share a couple of stories that are very different, but they both have the same heartbeat, and that is it's about spiritual growth. Pastor Dennis has been here, I think, as long as almost anyone on staff, and he, he's committed to be here till Jesus returns. So can we welcome Pastor Dennis to share with us? Thank you. On Wednesday morning, I will call Jill in Tennessee. I have her permission to tell the story at 8 a.m. I've done it every Wednesday, except when I'm traveling for about four years, but I've known Jill and her family for almost 24 years. I was initially their counselor in the Bay Area. We don't counsel anymore. 
And as that family changed and her kids left home and she was all alone, she said, can we still stay connected? And I said, sure. Part of the reason I did that was I knew her well. She's the most, one of the most abused and mistreated humans I've ever known, ever met in my life, and I've met hundreds. She, the fact that her survival is ongoing and even she's thriving is a miracle. She hasn't fall into, fallen into drug abuse or criminal activity or rage or anything else like that, but she still struggles. And she said about four years ago, we were still in touch. She goes, can we just touch base once a week? So all I do is I listen to her. I call her, I listen to her, we pray together, I offer a little guidance. And she told me on January 2nd, she said this, she goes, by being listened to all these years, she has come to feel known. Jill struggles to connect. Anyone with her history would struggle to connect, to be around people. It's just that trauma is so deep. She says, I feel known. And, and here's, here's what's so important. It is in belonging that we feel known. It is in being known by others we best experience the closeness and reality of our living Lord. And over time, things have changed for Jill. She now mentors two other women who are new in the faith and don't know a lot, and, and Jill's able to connect with them. They seek it out. It works. She's discipling them. I'm discipling Jill, and we've never called it that. We don't call it anything, but it's discipleship is happening. We have community. We're connected she no longer wonders what her purpose is in life when that's all she thought about for decades. We are a brother and sister in the body of Christ. And you see, this is church working in a very different way. What makes belonging so important? By belonging within the Christian community, we can learn we are not shackled and stuck forever by our circumstances. This happens also in a whole different way. See, there's Jill over here all by herself coming out of the trauma and tragedy, but we're connected. And now she's connecting with others. So, so God is pouring into her and into others. On Tuesday and Wednesday mornings in the Peninsula Room, men come together where I have the blessing of leading a Bible study. Print out a page in the book that we're studying with questions for us so it applies to them in life. And at the end of each session, we take prayer requests. I have a journal one of the guys gave me. It's over seven years old. And we ask about what we prayed about last week. All a guy has to do is show up, initially be harassed and teased about anything because that's how guys feel loved. <laughs> and I don't want to not love a guy. But guys love coming to this thing. They love being part of it. They show up. We make the coffee. We, we see what God has for us. We check on each other. Fellowship is happening. See, it's not a fellowship group. It's a Bible study group where fellowship happens. It's not a discipleship group. It's a Bible study where discipleship happens. And it isn't Dennis discipling alone. They disciple each other. The idea is we're growing, we're reminding, we're doing the things scripture has called us to do to become more like Jesus and to grow in fellowship and spread the love and the light and the word of the gospel. So, so we have two very different scenarios. We have this person over here who thought she'd never be able to connect with anyone, had this tragic life, and now is connected. And she's connected with two women where she lives, and she's holding down a job. It's very different. Over here, we have these guys just coming on two mornings a week, and it's sort, sort of more of a routine thing in church. God doesn't care how you do it. He says, I'll help you do it any way you need it to happen for you. That's the beauty of it. So I want to pray right now and rejoice that God has infinite possibilities for us to know him and grow in community. Father, you know everybody here intimately in great detail. There are those already firmly entrenched in a community and just loving what's happening and being discipled and those who have yet to do that. Move them, direct them, lead them, and help them in, invest in a group and others invest in them that they would know you better. Be more like Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank Dennis. Amen. And I got to tell you, Dennis is, is passionate about this, as is our whole, uh, team, our whole discipleship team. And I love what Dennis said, and this is really important for us at Shoreline. Some people will say, discipleship happens exactly like this. One person does this program with this one person over this amount of time and certain things, and then that's discipleship. Well, 
if that person's helping that person grow in their Christian faith and become more like Jesus, that is discipleship. But it's one of thousands of ways to do discipleship. Parents should be discipling their children. Spouses should be discipling each other. Friends should be discipling each other because all discipleship is is helping another person become more like Jesus and walk more with him. He becomes Lord more and more and we become more like him in our thoughts and our actions and our attitudes. Our motives get transformed. We want to see discipleship happen in hundreds of different ways here at Shoreline and we take that very seriously. So here's the next question. When do we focus inward? When do we focus on this community, this discipleship journey? And here's the answer. When we recognize God's potential to work in and through us, when we say, you know, God could use me to help you grow more in your faith, and God can use you to help me, man, I want to be part of this, and we enter in. When do we focus inward? Every week when we gather for worship. This is a time where we together are learning and growing and hopefully having conversations before and after services and praying together and encouraging each other. When do we focus inward? All week long. When we connect with other believers, every time you connect with another Christian person, it's an opportunity to walk down that road of discipleship, to learn from them and let them challenge you to love Jesus more, to share something that might spur them on and encourage them. So how can we go deeper inward? How do we go on this journey of discipleship? Well, first we gather around God's word. I want to encourage you to not only read God's word individually, but talk about what you're learning with other Christians. Share what God's teaching you. When you're with other Christians, open God's word, read it together, talk about it, whether it's in a Bible study or a class or in a small group or whether it's just spontaneously with friends saying, hey, what's God teaching you from his word? Assuming that you're reading the Bible because that's part of what we do as Christians. We open his word. How can we go deeper inward? We can talk with God in groups of all sorts of people. We we can just talk with God wherever we are, whatever we're doing. You know, you want, to go, you want to get closer to Jesus, talk to him. You're with a group of people and you want to encounter Jesus' presence, invite him in to the conversation. Uh, yesterday morning, between the heavy rain in the morning and the heavy rain in the afternoon, I had a chance to golf with, with three other guys, and we were not golfing, and it was just, you know, the place, it was sort of drenched, but the sun came, kind of opened up and came out, and the sky was piercing blue, and everything was so fresh, and, and the birds were just kind of like, oh, there's no rain, and they were cheap, you know, making their little bird noises. And on on like sixth or seventh green, I just said, three of the four of us had made pars, which is unusual in a group of four to have three pars, so we were feeling pretty good. And and so I actually just stood there, and I'm like, you know, and I looked, there's nobody on the tee, nobody behind us. I said, you know what? There's nobody behind us. And I I knew this. One One of the guys in the group goes to Shoreline. One of them is a family member of his who's really starting to grow in faith. And another guy is a guy who's not connected to church right now, but who really loves Jesus. And so I said, you know, I said, guys, can we just stop? And thank God for the beauty of this day and the chance to just be out here taking this walk. And they were like, yeah. And we weren't praying to make a good golf shot. We weren't praying to, you know, apologize for what we said after we made a bad golf shot. We were just, (laughs) Dennis mentioned that about golf. Thank you, Dennis. Um, He said, that's usually what the prayers are. But but we just, we just talked to Jesus, standing on the green with our eyes open and said, God, thank you for this place. Thank you for the health to be able to get up and walk. And we, and we, We just grew a step closer to Jesus together. That's discipleship. We have to take those moments and take hold of them and leverage them and engage in a new way. How can we go deeper inward? By making gathering normative and not an exception. By saying, I'm going to gather with God's people on a regular basis. Whether it's my commitment to be in in a men's small group that Dennis is talking about. Whether it's being in a women's small group. Whether it's saying, you know, I want to teach my high school kids or junior high kids that being with God's people is so important. We're making it a priority. We're together on Sundays and midweek. By saying to our children, hey, we're going to go to Awana. We're going to go to Sunday morning. You're going to be in the cove. And, And to say, this is part of the rhythm of our life. I think if we don't teach people the rhythm of being with God's people in another generation or two, it's going to go away. Because it's, 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 it's struggling now in so many places. And how do we show that we model it? That being to regularly gather with God's people is a normal part of our lives. To be willing to be challenged. When somebody gives you a challenge, to say thank you. If it's, if it's a challenge to become more like Jesus. Maybe your, your attitude or your words aren't quite lining up with where they ought to be. And, and another Christian says, you know, I noticed this and I think that's something you could work on. To go Thank you for caring enough about me to point out something I can grow. It's hard to do. But that's iron sharpening iron. That's spurring one another on towards love and good deeds, things that the Bible calls us to do. And and so be, be, be willing to be challenged and then take a chance to challenge someone else. 
Take a chance to say, I'm willing to say to someone else, I want to encourage you in your faith. I want to challenge you. You know, I, I haven't seen you in worship for a couple of months. Man, I, I wish you'd come back. We, you're missed. And, and I want to encourage you to make that part of your life. Challenging people to be in the scriptures, to be in prayer, to grow in generosity. All these things that are part of walking with Jesus. Be- because, see, God has said to us, listen, I've come to be your savior, to wash your sins away, to give you new life, to, to secure your eternity. That's great. Man, that's great. But he says, but don't forget, I've also come to be the leader of your life. And we learn to follow Jesus most powerfully and effectively in community. And so I want to ask you just to watch the screens, and you're going to see a short video of some of the leaders at Shoreline that God has called here to help create literally hundreds of different conduits and ways that we can grow in community and our spiritual journey, becoming more like Jesus. Go ahead and watch the screens. Hi, I'm Pastor Sean, and I have one of the greatest honors and privileges here at Shoreline Church and that I get to lead the discipleship division. And recently I sat down with a group of leaders of the discipleship division. These are ministry leaders who on a daily basis are helping people grow to become more like Jesus and all of that helping them get connected into the community of believers of Jesus Christ. And so as that, I asked them a couple of questions questions that really get at the heart and the importance of why would you want to get connected in community? What do you think inhibits people from taking that step to, 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 to step into community and be part of the broader church community? Uh, a precious commodity is time and time you don't get that back. And so um, that's something that, that's going to inhibit uh, or keep people from, from jumping in and volunteering and being a part of community. I think sometimes we forget that there's a little spiritual warfare that goes on sometimes in building community because God calls us to love him and to love others. And so I think that we have to understand uh, that we need to be praying and going beyond some of the barriers, knowing that this is God's call in our life. Um, and sometimes go past the fears that some people have or work through um, priorities if, if we are too busy. Are you tagging on something you mentioned, that people's fears, and I think there's a, a sense in which people have a little bit of concern, maybe a fear. Uh, am, am I going to be welcomed into a group? Am I going to be accepted? Is it okay for me to be part of this? But once entered into and you find out that, uh, hey, there's a group of people that are struggling with the same things that I do, maybe wrestling with the same situation, that, that can be overcome. And so then the second question then is the, those are the inhibitors. What are the blessings? If somebody were to say to you, well, why should I? Why should I engage in community? There's nothing worse than feeling alone. Um, and even in uh, an environment where you're around a lot of people, you can feel alone. And so when you have your church community, um, you have people to lean on who, um, who are struggling through some of the, the same struggles that, that you're struggling with. One thing I hear more than any uh, when women come to our women's mentoring is they would like a Christian friend. I think um, the world is hard, our workplaces, school, um, it's just life is hard. And so sometimes you just need to find that community of a safe place of people who believe what you believe, um, who can help grow you and challenge you maybe. Uh, but there's something about um, just having some friends. When you're a community of like-minded people uh, that are in tune with what God has called us to do, the, the impact you can have on this world is um, remarkable. I hope you could hear their hearts, their love for uh, helping people grow to become more like Jesus. And so today you might be asking, so what are the opportunities available for me and how can I grow in community here at Shoreline? So we want to share with you today a range of options that are available for you. And you'll see on the screens behind me, and, and I recognize that at first you're going, wow, that's a lot of opportunities, right? But really what I want to do is call your attention to the center screen here because it's all the same. The center screen here is the same as the two side screens. But I also want to be respectful that we have an online community. We also have folks in the family worship venue. So I'm going to walk through this slide for you to give you a better understanding of where might be that sweet spot 
for you to connect in community. And so if you look up here, and Kevin talked about this earlier, we're talking about spiritual formation. It's discipleship. It's simply growing the process by which we grow to become more like Jesus. And if you look at our chart and you look at this graphic, you can see that there's all kinds of different ways to do discipleship, amen? It's a, there's no single way. I hope you've heard that this morning. There's no single way to become more like Jesus. There's many different ways to do that. And I want to help you try to find that. We've actually got a couple of words here I want you to think about. The bottom here, we have interaction, and over here is instruction. And so as you look at the chart, as you move across the chart, you'll see that over here, it's highest levels of interaction. And when we talk about interaction, we're talking about Christ-like interaction, experiencing life together with other believers of Christ. And as you move over here, it's instruction. And these are higher areas where you're actually spending time growing and applying and understanding God's word. It's biblical instruction. And so like if you said, well, I'd like to get connected somehow, but what's a good entry point for me to do that? Over here is our community groups. And community groups are places where folks gather and they gather around things such as, as hobbies and sports and, and activities where they could come together and just really experience life together in, in those types of environments. Things like our basketball community, our women's fitness community, our board gamers community. Yes, we have a community of board gamers here at Shoreline that meets on a regular basis. And that is discipleship, amen? And as you move across the chart, you can see we've also got several others, but things here like small groups. And I know I'm looking around the room this morning and see a lot of our small group leaders are actually in this service. And these are groups that meet in people's homes, typically 10 to 12 people that gather, and they'll gather or they get some biblical instruction, but the primary purpose is really to interact with one another. And as we move over here, you can see we also feature things like our men's and women's and college Bible studies. Dennis talked about the men's Bible study earlier. That's an opportunity for us to come together and study God's word in great detail. But we also do have some interaction. The primary purpose is instruction. And then finally, we come way over here to the right side, and we've got these areas right here. In particular, I want to highlight our spiritual formation classes. This past Wednesday night, we launched our first night of those spiritual formation classes. And there were about 80 people came out to attend those and be part of those classes, many of you in this room. But guess what? It's not too late. There's lots of room for others to come, so we'd love to encourage you to come. I say, and we share all that with you to say, discipleship happens in all of these different opportunities. And I hope as I've been sharing today, you're looking up there and you're going, where's a spot for me to connect? Where might be a great place for me to take that first step and grow in community? You see, for me, I, I think about so often, we're just very comfortable staying where we're at as Christians. I'm one of those people, I think, if left to my own devices, I could probably just be very comfortable doing my spiritual journey alone. And what's interesting is a year and a half ago, I took one of these spiritual growth assessments over here on the far right, and guess what it told me? Pastor Sean, you could really grow a little bit in community. And so the Holy Spirit began to move in me. How might that how might, what, 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 that, like, what is that going to look like for you? Not coincidentally, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. There was a family about that same time that was experiencing a call in their life, saying, we just finished with our renovations in our home. We would love to offer our home, to open our home for a morning Bible study. And so in that process, guess what happened? The individual who owned the house came to me and said, Pastor Sean, we'd love to open our home but we need somebody to lead the Bible study. Do you know of anybody who might be interested in leading a Bible study? And guess what happened? In that moment, the Lord just really tugged on my heart and said, that's you. And so now every Tuesday morning, we've been gathering. We started out with four men, and we gather out on, toward the Salinas area because we know that not everybody can make it here into Monterey for a Bible study on Tuesday mornings or Wednesday mornings. So we've been meeting out there. And every Tuesday morning for the last year, we started out with four guys, and now we average about eight to 10 men every week, Tuesday morning, 6.30, gathered around the table, experiencing life together, and diving into God's word. 
That is powerful because we're living life in community together. And those men have been so powerful in my life in a profound way. They pray for me. They encourage me. They hold me accountable. And likewise, I hope that I am doing the same. And folks, that's the joy of experiencing life in community. But there's so many other ways for you to experience that. And so our hope and prayer today is that you will take one step, one step closer to connecting in community here at Shoreline. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us and that you've called us to your own. And we thank you, Jesus, that you equally love your church. And in that process, that you, you want us to grow, to connect in greater capacity in the community of believers. And Lord, today, it's, it's clear that there may be some folks who, who have yet to connect in community. And so our prayer today as leaders here at Shoreline is that they would take one step, whatever that looks like. Jesus, would you encourage them through the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you move them as we think about after the service, taking a step from the worship center to our connection center and communicating, connecting with our team there. So Jesus, have your way in our lives. We love you and we thank you again. In your name, amen. Amen. And I stand here right now with, with Dennis and with Sean. They're the two primary leaders over our whole division of discipleship, of the spiritual formation division. And really what we're inviting you to do is to look and say, boy, as I've encountered Jesus, okay, I, I think I got the Jesus as Savior part. He's washed my sins away. He's given me a new life, all these great things. But have I found the journey and the excitement? I mean, for Sherry, when she turned that card over this morning and went, oh, I get that too, not just your love, but some really great stuff, you know. It's like, man, that's a big deal. And I'm hoping today you'll go, wait a minute. There's, there's a part of my spiritual life that can become richer and more powerful and more beautiful. And we want to invite you into that. And as we close in prayer, I want to introduce you to the, they, There's a whole team of people that are, that are sort of our, our discipleship division. And they, they're from our admins to our directors to our pastors. So I want you to see them up on the screen here because we're going to pray for them in just a minute. And, and I want to say, I, some people may look at that team and say, you know, wh what does the church need that many people for to just to do discipleship? And people, that runs through people's minds. Let me tell you something. I study this. I travel all over the world with Sherry, and we work with churches. We're connected now through Organic Outreach International with about 40,000 churches globally that we work with. So I know a lot about the church. The average church in America is 75 to 85 people. And they have one pastor and one administrative support person, and usually a part-time music person. That's the average church. Shoreline Church, in our database, which we actually keep up to date, we have about 18,000 people who would say, I'm connected to Shoreline in some way. In a normal weekend and week at Shoreline, we have about 3,000 people in a normal week that are engaged, and that spreads out over a month's time to six to 7,000 people who are part of Shore, the life of Shoreline Church in a normal month. And here's the key. We want all of them to have a way to connect to become more like Jesus, to be in community. That takes a lot of work and a lot of prayer. And this team of people you see up there, they do that with children, with teens, with men and women and couples and adults of every age. With this many people, it's, it's, it's really like functioning with about 60 congregations. And this team leads, they're ready to lead you closer to that journey of growing in your faith in Jesus. So here's, we're going to pray together. I'm going to encourage you, because my wife has taught me you can pray with your eyes open. The Bible never says you have to close your eyes. It actually never even says you should. You're welcome to. But I want to ask you to look up at this picture as we pray. And Lord Jesus, we want to pray as we look up at that picture. Some of those leaders have the unique call of helping us with our children and our grandchildren, helping this next generation of little ones love Jesus. Will you bless them? Will you fill them with your spirit? Will you give them the creativity as we learn to disciple and help parents and family members disciple their children to love Jesus and to follow him? We look up there and we see uh, our, our youth leaders, middle school and high school leaders, and we know how they love this next generation of young people that are so beat up by our culture, and they're fed such a, just a pile of lies. And I, we pray together right now that those leaders of our student ministries will be anointed and protected and creative and help us learn how to lead those young people to be a generation that loves Jesus and becomes more like him. And we have leaders up there who oversee women's ministry and men's ministry and couples ministries and all those things. Would you bless all of them? Lord Jesus, we want to see this team be fruitful. Would you protect them and bless them? And then we want to pray for Dennis and Sean. We just, uh, come here, you guys, get in here. Um, I want to pray for these brothers, and we want to pray together for them as they have this unique calling of calling this congregation to learn not only to grow personally in our spiritual journeys, but to help others do the same and to use our gifts to be a blessing to others. Will you anoint and fill Sean and Dennis? We thank you for their faithfulness, for their passion, for their leadership, and we pray you will use them to help all of us 
grow closer to you and become more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen.